All right. Um, so today I'm going to be telling you about, uh, amongst other things, I'm, I'm going to be telling you about this construction called uh, ring, a ring VRF and this trick called a ZK continuation, which uh, I came up with at some point um, to, to make ring VRFs fast, very, very fast. Okay. So. VR, okay, so we'll, we'll say what a VRF is in a second. So to start out, we have um, people here probably generally know what a ring signature is. Um, so of course, historically, they were a little bit more, you know, some, some people like Zcash tend not to use the term, but in a certain sense, Zcash is a ring signature where you have this uh, fancy commitment, which is the entire blockchain. Um, and you know, so there's actually a, quite a variety of ring signatures and to some extent a huge amount of the stuff that's going on at this conference is talking about different types of ring signatures. Um, okay, um, now uh, VRFs are um, basically their signatures where you prove the evaluation of some pseudo random function that is tied to the, the key, the secret key of the signer. Makes sense. Um, this is the construction of them. If you look at it, so if, if I were to delete this line three, this would just be a Schnorr signature. Um, if it, this check in line three, if I delete it, I just have a Schnorr signature. Um, all it's really doing is it's proving that there's a, that this um, output point, which um, it's actually not the output, but this pre-output point I, I've called out is um, that it's, it's also a multiple of the secret key times whatever I've hashed to the curve. Um, and okay, fair enough. So, and then this, this last thing on the last line, this last hash is the PRF part. So you think about this out is keying the PRF. Okay, so what's a ring VRF? Um, it's simply a ring signature that also proves the evaluation of pseudorandom function. So it's a ring signature that's also a VRF. That's it. Um, all right, so to be able to build one, I need to enter slightly tweak this ECVRF. Uh, very minorly, all I've changed is to, is to add this T times K here. I've added this extra T into the proof and I've added this multiple here. But what this lets me do is now instead of my public key simply being the secret key times some generator, now my public key is simply a Peterson commitment to the secret key. Very simple, actually. All right. Now, uh, now I need to get a little bit more complex. I need to actually open up Cross 16 to be able to do something. Uh, well, okay. So first of all, now we're going to explain. Where, so this piece that I've just told you, this Peterson VRF, I'm going to use that as the second half of what we're calling ZK, a zk continuation. And, um, but for the first half, the part that actually gets continued, I need to, I need to cross 16. So there's, okay, think about it this way. What is the fastest, uh, what is the fastest snark? Well, it's one you don't prove at all. It's one that you've proven in the past and you're just gonna reuse. Okay, so this is cross 16. Um, this is cross 16. It, um, it, we have, so the things, the, the, the Greek letters are toxic waste. Um, the, uh, the A, B, and C are the proof, and the X is the public inputs, but sort of after they've already been bundled into a curve point. So there are some pieces of the verifier key, and you multiply them by the different public inputs, and you add them up, and that becomes X. All right. Uh, so that could look like this. We can have a, the secret key times some generator, G, named as in the previous slide. Actually, it won't be a generator here. It could be, but it won't, it, it won't necessarily be in Gross 16, but whatever, that doesn't matter. And then we have this K, and so there, that right there is my com PK from the Peterson VRF already. Now, if I did literally this, and if the K was in the Gross 16, then it would be shitty, because now I have processed the secret key in the Gross 16, which I don't ever want to do. I've also... Um, uh, I, and I've also got to prove this cross six, reprove this cross sixteen every time I use it. So we're not going to do that. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to take this k, we're going to mock in the trusted setup, we're going to multiply it by some toxic waste elements, and we'll get this k delta guy, which can now be introduced into C. So this procedure here, if you remove the two k got the two k terms, this is the re-randomization procedure for cross sixteen, 
and now the new K, the, these new K terms means that I can re-randomize the thing and also re-randomize the public input. And it, it, this costs me, what, four, so it costs me two, two, yeah, four G1 scalar multiplications and two G2 scalar multiplications for the B line. So extremely cheap. Um, so I get to reuse my GRAS 16, and what I've, the point of all of this is so that I've re-randomized the ABC with the, the typical re-randomization procedure for GRAS 16, and, and, and this adding this K lets me re-randomize the public input as well. And okay, so now I, what I need to be able to use this is I need for the, the parts of the public input that, uh, the, so the dot, dot, dots may be the verifier, the actual verifier will see, but for this com PK, I need a proof of knowledge of that. But I already had that. The, the Peterson VRF gives me that. So this is it. I have this GRAS 16 and the Peterson VRF, and I have a, um, this gives me a ring VRF that is extremely cheap. In fact, the marginal cost of proving is totally eight G1 scalar multiplications plus two G2 scalar multiplications. So this is IRTF, you know, IETF crypto fast. This thing is blazingly fast. Not like the, this is not like other stuff that you've seen at this conference. These, this thing is fast. Um, and uh, okay, so this is like, this is, okay, so this X is describing the, uh, the X from sort of the previous slide. But of course, this BK is not really in the GRAS 16. I've just added it externally. Uh, so the actual GRAS 16 would look something like this. I have to, I have to represent the uh, BLS 12.377 point on the JubJub curve. So I have to split the key up because the JubJub curve is a bit smaller. Uh, and I can do this, this JubJub arithmetic cheaply inside the snark. And then I have to prove that this is in the ring commitment. Fine. Um, so this is pretty cool. Now, there's one shitty thing here, which is that I'm still processing the, the secret key inside the snark, and now I don't have to reprove the snark very often, but I still do have to reprove the snark every time the ring changes. So, which could, depending, you know, it could be non-trivial. Uh, so I can get rid of that too if I change my GRAS 16 to um, just simply translate from this JubJub representation to, to the BLS 12.377 representation, and then prove the JubJub representation in some other way. Like, for example, I could use calc or calc plus. Or I could also have, like, this GRAS 16 could just prove that the thing, that the secret key represents a public key in a block, and then I could use calc or calc plus to prove that blocks are, you know, exist. So now this is a little bit heavier than the one on the previous slide. But now I only ever need to prove this GRAS 16 once ever. And so I only ever actually use my secret key in a GRAS 16 once. And, and the thing can be extremely efficient. All right. Um, so as I said, this is sort of, uh, this is sort of I, you know, IET crypt, IETF crypto fast. Um, and what can we do with it? OK. So um, how can an identity be safe to use online? Well, the answer is, is that it shouldn't say anything about you. So there's, there's the, w, our, the W3C and the ARMA credential people and whatever are pushing this stuff about having like attribute-based credentials that talk, tell, that will leak, selectively leak shit about you. But the problem is most of that stuff will get misused. Um, so what we really want is an identity system that doesn't leak anything about you. It just like gives you a unique identity that's unlinkable from your identity in any other context. So how do we do this? Um, we, okay, so we make a ring that consists of people with as much as we can ensure it, one key per person. And here's what your browser does. It says, validates the TRS, the TLS cert of a site, including the CT, the transparency logs. And then it sends the VRF signature with message equals site name. There's your identity on the site. There's only one of you there. If they want to ban you, they can ban you. It's done. Um, on the subject of banning, you know, if you want to do weird, you can do weird things where identity changes each month or you put like multiple identities like of multiple months in there. And now this gives the ability to sort of a person to sort of disappear for a month and then come back fresh. There's all kinds of weird things you can do with ring VRFs. Um, now I'm going to tell, so a caveat, I said, so these are blazingly fast ring signatures. Um, they're not actually that great for long-term money. 
because I I need this the to prove to prove ring membership. I'm proving like I would be proving the existence of a UTXO, but I don't generally use a U UTXO more than once. So this, while it's super great for identity type things and other stuff, it's not great for really long-term money. Turns out it's really awesome for ephemeral money. So, okay, uh, people may be aware that we have a climate change problem, the world's going to plus four C in 100 years, there's no way we'll still have a billion people on this planet. Um, you know, most people are going to die. Um, there's no way we can ever get to Mars and other places unless we figure out how to burn less shit, use less shit, et cetera. Okay, so, and we see this now, so a lot of the rationing we have is from other fuck-ups, but like the, the cooking oil shortage or the mustard shortage in France is because of climate change. We're already feeling it. So what do governments do in this kind of situation? Well, they ration stuff. So what you can do with a Ring VRF is they're very good for rationing. You can you could have an EU ration card or something with these things, and you know if you're buying mustard and there's no mustard, then it, it, then the machine asks you to tap your ration card and it asks sort of mustard in the week and some counter based on how much mustard you're allowed to buy in a week. And um, now what we do is we handle this exactly like exactly like other blockchain money or like chum chummy is more like a chummy and eCash. We just look for all these nullifiers, and where we just save the nullifiers, but now we only have to save them for about a week. We don't have to save them forever like we do in something like Zcash, um, or whatever the time thing is. Now, us being blockchain people, this is awesome for us. If there was an EU ration card, we could use the hell out of it to get like, you know, you have a pay-to-play game on chain, and you just, you, and you just, you, you, you get so many free plays per day or whatever. Um, so we can actually use this thing in a lot of ways uh, to like rate limit stuff that happens on chain. And anyway, in general, this is a rate limiting thing. I, I went the climate change direction with the slide, but any kind of rate limiting application is, is very nice. Um, okay. Now, specifically in the climate change case, there's something else really cool here. So um, if you think about certificates, which would be the other kind of way you would construct this kind of thing. Um, certificates um, are commonly a bit uh, fucked in that like CAs were issuing fraudulent certificates, which is why we need the certificate transparency system. Uh, in the COVID, you know, there were all these fraudulent COVID certificates issued by different countries, et cetera. It just leaks, the keys leak, the, somebody that at their issues fraudulent certificates, whatever. The ring and the ring signature helps us fix this because it's just a database and it can be audited. Um, now, it also brings some problems depending on how we want to build it. It's non-trivial. You know, like we could... We, it, that, that's a lot of complexity I don't want to discuss in the talk. Feel free to talk to me afterwards. But it's, you know, but basically the ring actually solves us a lot of problems without having to build something like certificate transparency on top. Okay, last thing I want to tell you about is a protocol that we're, you, what we're using this for at Web3 Foundation and in Polkadot. So this is a beautiful sassafras tree. Um, many of you in this room have a affinity for this plant, even though you've never heard of it. Um, the, um, but it's, uh, anyway, um, the, whoops, yeah. So, so it's just a backronym, and it's, a, it's basically, if you've heard of these things, like Dan Bonnet has a paper on secret single leader elections. It's how you have a block production protocol that produces like one block every six seconds with only one block producer, and the block producer is anonymous before they make their block. That's the goal. And so it's a absolute, so fixed time block production with, uh, uh, with the block production being anonymous. So, um, what we're going to do is we're just going to have a schedule of block production, and the schedule is going to be given by ring VRF outputs, and we're going to just, people are going to anonymously announce these ring VRF, or block producers are going to anonymously announce good ring VRF outputs, and then we're going to sort them. And um, this is a bit like, so VRF protocols are commonly like card games, and this is a bit like playing cards against humanity. You sort of you put your card down, and then there's this anonymity system of shuffling the cards, and then all the cards are flipped over. And the fact that it's on the table is the proof that it was your that it was one of the proper cards. And here we need to use the ring VRF for that. 
And okay, so advantages of sassafras. So the other competitor for uh, a, a secret single leader election is this kind of on-chain shuffle thing proposed by Dan Bonet. There's various ways of optimizing it. Um, it gives you better anonymity than sassafras because sassafras' anonymity is really a, the network layer anonymity, which is weaker. It's like you use Tor or you use some other kind of network thing. Um, or MixNet, whatever. Or one hop MixNet is what we'll actually use. So it's weaker anonymity, but the thing is we, can, we actually know what we want. In Tor, you don't know what you want the anonymity for. So it has to be really, really strong, and it's not. But, so you're sad. But here, we know exactly what we want the anonymity for. It's to get good on-chain randomness and, and some other certain specific properties, like difficulty and censorship and whatever. So we can, we can analyze it. And um, so we get randomness of about the quality of prowess, which is not the best, but it's pretty good, actually. Um, and it's vastly more efficient than bonus shuffle stuff. And another cool thing so, um, is so block producers know exactly when their slot is coming in, in advance, which is either an advantage or a disadvantage. But in our context, it tends to be an advantage. And they can even prove that they have their, know when their slot is coming, which is very cool. And if we, slightly add, if we add a little bit extra into the ring VRF or use it in funky ways, then we can have essentially a Tor-like circuit to each upcoming block to each upcoming slot, to the block producer in that slot, which means that users can just send their transaction directly to a block producer. This is a bit like what Solana does. It's a bit like why Solana falls over all the time. But, but it, uh, if you say I'll have a mempool as a fallback, it's fine. And what it means is that most of the time, you can avoid the mempool, which saves. Actually, if you're using your crypto right, it saves. Uh, so on the crypto side, it saves like 60% or something. Um, or more if you're using snarks, certain snarks. And on other things, it will save you know 50% because these transactions have to float around through the mempool or something. Now, in something like Polkadot context, it's less than that because we don't have that many nodes on the parachains, but uh, whatever. Um, one of the other things it does is it gives you better defenses against minor extractable value and front running. Uh, if you use it in the right ways and combined with other things, it's just one tool in the box. but. Uh, last comment, um, generally these bespoke chains like Cosmos or, or Polkadot or you know, Polkadot parachains or whatever, generally chains that only do one thing aren't going to have as much, anywhere near as much of an MEV problem in the first place because they can find all these funky ad hoc solutions that are you know, very simple and Sassafras plays, generally plays nicer with that kind of thing. Um, so anyway, yeah. Smart contracts are shitty. Do you want to take questions? Or? Uh, yeah, if people have questions, sure. Um, cool. Does anybody have any questions for Jeff? Yeah. Cool. Where can we read more about this? Where can Sorry? Where can we read more about this? Uh, hopefully, we'll have a paper on ePrint within a month. Um, there's a repo. Actually, the paper, one version of the paper is just in our Ring VRF, web, W3F slash Ring, Ring VRF. So GitHub, W3F slash Ring, Ring VRF uh, will give you a version of things. Um, the, the code that's there is really outdated. We've built about three versions of this thing at this point. And, or, and I'm working on sort of a fourth version that it is really this thing. Uh, Sergey in the back has another version because while I say we're going to use this version on Polkadot, maybe we won't because, um, because we, since we only have 1,000 validators, maybe this thing is slightly overkill and we can do something. But anyway, that has to just be tried. Because there's actually many different ring VRFs you could build um, if, you're, if you're interested in it. And well, like I said, we built several. But for small rings, it's different. What you do would be different than this. Other questions from anybody? OK, cool. So we finished up about 10 minutes early. We've got one more talk today. Uh, Dmitry Kovratovich, you're not going to want to miss it, all about hashing and ZK. So uh, feel free to take a break, fill up your coffee, fill up your water, and come back uh, here um, 4 o'clock sharp.